great. So uh, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, on behalf of uh, Sarah Bennett, who's your real host, I'm just the moderator. <laughs> and, and Rob from R4D. And Rob from R4D, so surrounded by a great lineup here this morning. Um, we're so happy you all could join us for what I think is actually going to be a, a super interesting discussion. And I think all the more so because this is a relatively small group, so it means we can have lots of opportunity for engagement and, and conversation and, and back and forth. Um, uh, one of the reasons I was just so delighted when Rob and Sarah um, asked if I'd be willing to uh, help moderate the discussion today is because I think we're in such an interesting moment right now when we start to try to think about these questions around transition and sustainability. You know, on the sort of global stage, we have the financing for development meeting coming up in July, where a lot of the conversation, of course, will be on global health, is going to be about how we sort of take forward the sustainability agenda into development more broadly. Um, that will bring us into the whole discussion around the sustainability, the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, the successor to the MDGs, and what that framework's going to look like and how we learn from the MDG experience and make sure that what we are now teeing up for the agenda for the next 15 years also is going to be owned well by countries and be sustainable over the longer term. Um, we also have the work just being done by a lot of the major bilateral donors, of course by PEPFAR, and we have great PEPFAR representation here today thinking about the longer term sustainability questions. And we've seen Gavi work on this for a long time, you know, now Global Fund's trying to think about it a little bit differently. Um, and certainly from the point of view of my own organization, and I probably should have introduced myself before I started, <laughs> my name is Lisa Cardi and I'm the director of the uh, UNA's office here in Washington, D.C. Um, but certainly from the point of view of my own organization, um, this is an issue that just is really at the top of the agenda. You know, And we've seen some very promising trends in the last couple of years. You know, For the first time, I think two or three years ago, we saw actually resources from the Global South starting to exceed donor resources in terms of flows and support for HIV, but it's, it's, it's still not at the margin that we, we would like to see. We need to work harder on that. A lot of that increase was driven by, um, by actions taken by South Africa and Brazil and, of course, India. And now we need to think about how we bring those same trends to um, some of the, the lower income and lower middle income countries. Um, so we have a terrific group this morning. We have um, four, three of the major institutions working in the global health and, uh, of course, um, a very significant government on the global health agenda that's going to be joining us. Um, I think what I might do is just briefly introduce each of our panelists, um, and then we'll do a quick maybe round the table introduction so we know who's here with us. Um, so we're going to hear from four panelists uh, today. We're going to hear from Dr. Sarah Bennett, um, who is an associate uh, professor at the Department of International Health at the Bloomberg School, and has spent most of her professional career focused on issues around health system strengthening and transition, and has done a special, at the request of the Gates Foundation, has done a special examination of the transition plans and structure and evolution of that within the Abahan program. Um, we're going to hear from Matangi Jairam, who is the senior program officer based in New Delhi with the Gates Foundation, working on Abahan. And Matangi has been with the Abahan program for about seven years and explicitly working on this issue around transition planning and has really brought it to the point where it is today. Um, and then from Rob Hecht as well, who I think is probably known to many of you. Rob, a managing director at Results for Development and long career previously at IAVI and the World Bank, also at UNAIDS. Um, so it'll be great to hear his perspectives more broadly on where the Abahan experience kind of fits into the broader transition agenda. Um, and then we're also going to have joining us by, by a video, by a video message, um, Dr. Niraj Dringa, who is the Deputy Director of NACO in India. And he had actually very much hoped to be with us here in person this morning, but because of a small health issue, he wasn't able um, to join us. Um, so before we jump into the main program, can I just suggest maybe that we simply go around and just a quick maybe name and institutional affiliation so everybody knows who everyone is. And maybe we'll start with the gentleman over here. Um, uh, my name's Andrew Waiter. I'm from Save the Children. Uh, Thayer Rosenberg, Results for Development. John McManus, Friends of the Global Fight. Shana Vidai, Friends of the Global Fight. You know, why don't we, let's, con let's continue around the, the, the window, okay? And then we'll go back 
the table. Okay, so please, sir. Lee Fredman with Results for Development. I am Tess Rickman with Results for Development. Hi, I'm Catherine Patton with the CSIS Global Policy Center. Hi, I'm Jennifer Hill with the Center for Global Policy 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 Issues. Um, so uh, please help yourself to coffee and refreshments throughout. Um, the gentleman's room is outside the door, and ladies is apparently upstairs on the next floor. Um, if you have not signed in, please do go ahead and sign in before you leave. Um, so I think what we'll do is we're going to start out um, with the presentations, and I think we're going to go to Matangi first, who's going to help set the broader context, and then we'll go directly to the video message from Dr. Um, Duringa and then to Sarah and then to Rob to sort of bring it all together. Um, we'll probably just do quick clarifying questions after each presentation, um, but we hope to get through the presentations in sort of 45, not more than 50 minutes, and then have the balance of time um, for discussion and Q&A. Um, so with that, I think I will give the floor to Matangi. Welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I have a soft voice, so I hope folks there can hear what I'm saying. So thank you very much. I must thank uh, Sarah and Rob for jointly hosting this dissemination. And uh, right now, as we speak, we, we are in the third phase of Avahan. And uh, one of the goals for the program is to dis disseminate the lessons learned from the decade-long decade -long program in India. Right. So before we get into the nuts and bolts of the actual process of transition, which Sarah will allude to in her presentation, I thought it was important to set the context because one can't assume that all of you know about the Avahan program. So some of the initial slides may be stating the obvious. Uh, some of you might have heard about it. But I'll just breeze through some of the basic slides and spend more time talking about the second phase of the program, which focused on transition. Right? And like Lisa said, at the end of the presentation, if you have any clarifications, happy to answer them. Um, so Avahan was meant to be a 10-year program and broadly divided into two phases, right? So phase one was about scaling up the program. And the backdrop or the background to the Gates Foundation investment was a study done by CSIS uh, in, in the early 2000s. And at that time, it was projected that uh, approximately 20 to 25 million people would be living with HIV AIDS in India. Of course, that pr projection is incorrect right now because as we speak, it's roughly around 2.5 million people living with HIV AIDS in India. But that was the urgency, right? So even private foundations like the Gates Foundation invested something like 258 million uh, US dollars in the first phase of the program. Uh, so like I said, phase one was about scaling up the response in India. And phase two was about in a phased and gradual manner handing over the interventions to the government of India. Right, so the key words here uh, is to look at that. The fact that transition planning was initiated as early as 2006, right, while we knew that you know, the program was winding up by 2013. Right. The other key word here for this particular discussion is that the actual transition got completed by 2012, and we spent another additional year providing what we call as the post-transition support to the government of India. Right, so these were the two initial phases, and frankly, we didn't visualize a third phase of Avahan. By 2013, it was meant to be a sunset program within the India country office. But um, what we felt as a, a small three-person team that's left of Avahan right now 
is that while the transition to the government has been efficient and it's, it's something that's over and done with, um, but the transition to the next set of what we call the natural owners of the program, the communities, uh, we had started <coughs> working with them in the second phase of the program. Right? And that seemed like unfinished business. And it didn't seem like a responsible exit to say that, you know, that piece is over, over and done with. Right? And while we were you know, sort of thinking of winding down, uh, NACO came back to us and said that, you know, you really can't step off some of the critical areas of support that you have been extending to NACO. And I'll, I'll speak to that in my subsequent slides. So we went back to the leadership team within the foundation and said that we don't want new monies. So all the grantees who worked in the first two phases of Avahan, we looked at savings. And we look, looked at some of the underperforming grants, and we managed to repurpose a substantial amount of money for what is the current phase of Avahan. And right now, which is 2014 to 17, the focus is threefold. So the three broad objectives is, one, we continue to work with NACO uh, in supporting some of the key institutional mechanisms which ensures that the focus on the targeted interventions continues. Second is to work with the communities. If you ask me, that's the key focus for this phase. And the third is to, you know, it, it would be a pity really to not talk about what we have learned from the decade-long experience in India and not share it with, you know, a larger audience. It could be within India and outside India. So this is one of the part of the dissemination series that you're seeing. So. In terms of the actual uh, scale up, the design was to, obviously, I mean, in a country like India, it is a concentrated epidemic, unlike many of the African countries where it's mostly generalized with concentrated pockets. So it was very clear from the very beginning, based on the data available to us, that we had to work with the key populations, right? So it, the key populations meaning predominantly female sex workers <coughs> and uh, men who have sex with men and transgender population, people who inject drugs. So these were the three core groups. And in phase one of the program, we also worked with what we call as a bridge population, the migrants and truckers, and the clients of sex workers. And the other no-brainer, frankly, was to look at data to focus on the high prevalent states. So the foundation said that while the government of India focuses on the rest of the geographies, <coughs> our investments will be catalytic in focusing on the six states which had the highest prevalence. And even today, despite you know, uh, significant declines in the um, HIV prevalence in the general population, these six states continue to be high burden states. right? So I'm talking about the four southern states of Maharashtra, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and the two states in the northeast that you see highlighted in blue, uh, Manipur and Nagaland. Uh, in terms of the uh, transmission dynamics, it's predominantly sex work driven in the southern parts of the country, whereas in the northeastern <coughs> parts of the country, it's an IDU epidemic, right? So, you know, in uh, India, everything is about scale. So if you look at the numbers, we covered six states, 82 districts, 600 plus towns, and a combined state population of approximately 300 million, which is equal to the size of countries in, you know, many other places, many other continents, and uh, roughly 300,000 high-risk groups covered through our program. And those red lines that you see in the map is the truckers' routes, where we had truckers' interventions in phase one of the program. And those uh, <coughs> little red dots is where we had the male client program. Again, these programs didn't exist in phase two of the pro uh, phase two of Abahan. Um, the other approach in phase one was, I mean, obviously it was not something that we invented, right? So we looked at other large scale HIV prevention programs and looked at a proven package of interventions which worked elsewhere. But what was unique to Avahan was this a sort of an integrated approach which, which also looked at additional components beyond just commodity distribution and looking at the biomedical risk, which includes STI treatment, uh, you know, HIV testing, etc to also work on the enabling environment because ultimately you know HIV all of us know is also a social disease so to speak so unless you so address the underlying social determinants things like violence crisis and if you don't create an enabling environment especially in a country like India where it's quite in your face 
uh, you can't actually even talk about things like quantum distribution right so in this whole thing if you ask me one thing which has been a cornerstone and which is unique to avahan his whole concept of community mobilization right and which is why i mean the naysayers and skeptics say that you know once you start work working with the communities it's more than a decade long kind of investment uh, so should you have even looked at something like this i would still say yes because early on into the program one realized that you know if you didn't work on violence reduction a woman a sex worker could not even carry a condom in her purse right so the cops would come and pick her up only you know she was standing in a bus stop soliciting sex work she had a condom condom in her bag and that became an issue and she would get arrested right so the initial 2 to 3 years there was a lot of focus on violence reduction so much so you know a lot of my colleagues i didn't work in phase 1 of the program maybe hari can uh, talk to it but uh, a lot of women used to believe that avahan is a violence reduction program and not so much a hiv reduction program um this is part of the i mean if you look at the overall avahan design as part of the classic <coughs> does framework design operate execute sustain so we spoke about the design elements um i don't want to get into too many details i can share you know a lot of literature around this but just wanted to call out to as part of the execution uh, strategy um it was meant to be a rapid and simultaneous scale up across all the 600 towns uh, that you saw in the map earlier we didn't believe in a pilot project say in a district or a sub district level <coughs> and depending on what we saw scale it up so we said that you know let's roll it out right so but again the challenges were that it was a large scale program uh it was a very diverse kind of a setting that you were catering to right so a rural setting say in karnataka the demands in the landscape is very different compared to you know a brothel setting typically in large cities like mumbai bangalore or hyderabad or the northeast is so difficult to operate in because geographically for people to travel from you know one place to another even if it's like 2 kilometers it's very difficult because it's a hilly terrain and a lot of sort of what do you call maoist kind of activities happening there so the initial days even doing basic outreach in states like nagaland manipur was a huge challenge right so how did we overcome all that is by these are some of the success factors not all of it one is obviously to look at data right so how do you optimize your resources right so where do you program even within a state right how do you pick districts which have the relatively higher prevalence and as again relatively higher population of sex workers idus msms etc um the second is to i think this is very critical in the avahan program is we came up with what we call as a common minimum program right so let me just give you an example so the way the sti services were delivered the guidelines were common across all the states right so while we had a cmp a com common minimum program we allowed for flexibility to cater to the local needs right so say for example the guideline said that one peer educator from the community would cater to 60 other sex workers right beat in terms of behavior, behavior change communication distributing condoms getting her to come to a sti clinic etc so one is to 60 works well in a city based setting right but in a rural setting where a peer educator has to travel a lot one is to 60 was not practically possible so we said maybe it should be a 1 is to 35 or a 1 is to 40 so those were the kind of flexibilities that were built in early on in the program um which initially the government had a problem accepting because you know naco tends to go by the rule book but eventually as the program evolved today if you see this whole approach of a cmp with flexibility built in has also been adopted by naco as part of the guidelines right of course i mean it's a no brainer that you know once you start engaging communities as agents as frontline workers you see a dramatic increase in the uptake of services right so initially a lot of outreach was happening by non community outreach workers also right so one of the learnings was that when you have to do a social network analysis and do an intelligent estimation of your denominator the more you involve the community 
and the more active role taken by the communities, like I said, condom uptake went up, right? More women started coming into the clinics. So this whole concept of peer education and engaging communities as peers was also part of the rapid and simultaneous scale up. And this is just a indicative chart to show you that the quick ramp up of both what we call as the soft and hard infrastructure. Hard infrastructure would be things like very quickly setting up the drop-in centers, safe spaces where women, women could come in and talk about issues that were of concern to them, right? Setting up of program-run clinics because one, the government uh, hospitals were not, you know, they were not sort of geared up to uh, look at STI services. And sex workers were not comfortable walking into a government center for STI treatment. So in the first phase of Avahan, we set up what we call as program-run clinics. Right? And that created a lot of comfort for the women to say that, you know, I know the doctor, there is no stigma and discrimination here. Right? So that's the hard infrastructure. Soft is, of course, the entire the human resources piece. Peer educators, outreach workers, uh, your um, nurses, doctors in the STI clinics, etc. Uh, that was phase one. Quickly jumping to the phase two of the program, if you remember, in the earlier slide, I had mentioned that the thinking around transition started way back in 2006, right? So transition was deliberately meant to be a gradual process. It, it was not like, you know, one fine day you hand over all the 170-odd interventions from Avahan to the government of India and walk away, right? So it was meant to be, like, if you see, these are the three broad areas where we worked in. So bulk of our investments was with the targeted intervention. <coughs> so we said that let's transition 10% in 2009. And we looked at interventions which were performing relatively better. Right? So these were in uh, states and districts where HIV prevalence was low. The NGOs were performing well. So that's the first 10%. And that was the most difficult and challenging piece, if you ask me. I think when Sarah talks about the actual transition evaluation, a lot of uh, feedback from the ground. Um, we got to hear that, you know, and even for us as program officers based in the states, working very closely with the state government, a lot of pain in terms of, you know, aligning our interventions with the government intervention, so on and so forth. But with each phase, I think we learned from our mistakes. And when the bulk of the interventions were handed over in 2012, I think it was very efficient because we had learned from the two other tranches of transition. And the others, the truckers' interventions were handed over in two phases, one in 2010, the other in 2011. And condom social marketing interventions, I mean, this by itself is a huge piece to talk about. Like I said, I'm not getting into the details. Um, the other piece of transition is to ensure that, you know, any donor-driven program, you have the flexibility of funding, uh, you have the freedom to run it the way you want it, right? But um, I remember the Deputy General, General for NACO, a lady called Sujata Rao, who used to head NACO during this time when we started talking about transition. She was very categorical, saying that I cannot afford to take on any donor-funded interventions because it's not completely aligned to mirror what the government-run interventions look like. So whether it was a BMGF-funded intervention or a USAID-funded intervention, roughly our costs were anywhere between 15 to 20 percent over and above what a government intervention looked like, right, in terms of budgets. So a large part of our time, when I say our time, it could be starting with program officers like me, working in the trenches with our grantees to the state AIDS control societies to the NGOs at a district level. I think collectively we spent a good three years actually aligning everything from budgets to what the staff structures looked at, look like in these interventions to even things like you know the data collection formats for your monitoring and evaluation, the monthly reporting that happens. Everything had to be aligned before we handed over the interventions to the government. Right? So when I talk of alignment, it's across three levels. At a fundamental level at the base is the physical handing over of the interventions. So the 169 odd interventions managed by the NGOs and the community-based organizations funded by the Gates Foundation, aligned to look like the 1,200 NGOs and CBOs which were funded by the <coughs> government, the NACO-funded uh, interventions. 
At the next level is those nine state lead partners. What you see as SLPs are the immediate grantees, the Gates Foundation grantees. So across the six states, we had nine state lead partners. And they worked closely with their counterpart in the government, which is the State AIDS Control Society. So there was some amount of skill transfer that happened from our partners to their counterparts in the government. And of course, at the top is the entire policy advocacy done by the Gates Foundation team sitting in Delhi, including folks like Hari and others, who were literally day in and day out dealing with NACO. Right? So a large part of um, the guidelines which we see today, the guidelines for the targeted interventions, we had a significant role to play in terms of helping NACO write up the guidelines. And that was one means of sharing our own tools, knowledge, methodologies on the ground with the government. So that's how the adoption happened. This is just to sure, thank you. Uh, this is just to let you know that, you know, post transition, I mean a lot of people ask that, I mean you had significant staff either through the Gates Foundation or through the grantees to see the transition through, but after transition worked, right? So this is where you know I cannot underscore the significance or the importance of having what we call as the technical support units, right? So these are funded typically by donors. So uh, as a Gates Foundation, we fund two TSUs in the southern states. USAID has many other states right now, roughly around eight or more uh, TSUs in India. And we also fund the National Technical Support Unit, which works very closely with NACO. So this is like a quasi you know, government body. I mean, these are professionals hired by donors like us, but they are sort of embedded in the government system. So on a regular basis, they are working very closely with the government to ensure that <coughs> there is rigorous monitoring and evaluation of these various targeted interventions, right? So they are sort of, you know, they, they ensure that NACO is able to keep the eye on the ball as far as quality is concerned. So very quickly, the graphs show that your key indicators did not drop post-transition. And this is a favorite slide because it shows significant the impact slides uh, across the four southern states. Um, and most of you, I'm assuming, you would have read the Lancet article which says that approximately 600 infections averted uh, through the Alahan program. 600,000, 600, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I'll just pause here. I mean, these are fairly self-explanatory. I'm also running behind time. So um, there are many lessons learned, obviously. So if you broadly classify the lessons learned from phase one, it's not all, but the significant learnings. So the eyes, Sorry, okay, uh, TI is this targeted intervention. So this is the basic unit of, uh, you know, the service delivery, right? So the key populations that you're serving is targeted intervention. Here, I just want to allude to the last point that, you know, what sets apart Avahan even within the um, foundation is the fact that uh, unlike many other programs where you would have program officers making grants out of Seattle and managing grants from there and, you know, maybe yearly check-ins uh, to meet with the grantees and look at what's happening in the field. The fact that, you know, it was a very conscious decision on part of the then country director, Ashok Alexander, to insist that he wanted a team to be based in India. And we actually had program officers like me, not even based in Delhi. I was based in Hyderabad. I had counterparts in Mumbai and Karnataka. And on a almost daily basis, we were dealing with our, you know, the state AIDS control society. So that quality of relationship management, I think, really helped uh, an efficient transition process. Um, again, these are the lessons from the phase two of our program. One needs to plan for it up front. You can't do it as you're sort of, you know, coming closer to the transition timeline. Um, obviously, it requires funding, right? So. While we started off with 258 million in phase one, we actually required an additional 100 million for the actual transition process to happen. Right, so it's not something that you cannot you can do without funding. Um, again, here I just want to highlight point number six is that, and I think it's very relevant for today as we speak in a environment where is where you have funding constraints. I think donors still have a role to play because. How you stay engaged uh, is very important. So you don't necessarily need big monies, 
um, you can be a thought partner to the government also, right? So that's important. Um, very quickly, maybe we can come back to this even later. Currently, the phase three of the program, if I can summarize it this way, uh, so broadly, you know, one can look at four risks that the key populations face. So when you talk about the